Hi, today we're going to talk about simple harmonic motion. So we have three goals today. We're simply going to talk about what it is, simple harmonic motion, and it's a particular kind of uh, oscillatory motion, a special kind, sort of, a, sort of maybe the simplest possible kind of oscillatory motion. And we'll really focus on springs today in particular. We'll look at uh, the force applied by an ideal spring when that spring gets stretched or compressed from its natural length. And then we're going to look at uh, potential energy for springs. So we'll define a, an equation for potential energy. And so again we're applying ideas that we're familiar with, force and energy ideas, to a new system. And we'll see how it works. Okay. And what we've got here at the bottom is just a block on a spring. And the spring is stretched from its equilibrium position. So we let the system go from rest. And what we see is it undergoes simple harmonic motion. And this is motion back and forth uh, on, the, uh, on the spring. OK, so we're going to try and investigate this in terms of forces and energy, that kind of system. OK, so we'll start by talking about forces. And we'll look at the spring force. And we're very good now at dealing with situations where forces are constant. Now, springs, the force is not constant. If your spring is neither stretched nor compressed, then it's not exerting any force at all. If you stretch it, you get a force in the opposite direction from if you compress it. If you stretch it more, you get more force. OK, so uh, what we're going to do, though, is idealize this particular situation. And in an ideal case, what we get is a linear force as a function of uh, position, or really displacement from the spring's natural length. OK, so this graph shows this linear function, force as a function of position. And so if you put the object at the origin at x equals 0, that's the spring's natural length, you get no force at all. If you move the block on the spring so the spring is compressed, so you're moving the block to the right, well the spring pulls back to the left. And so here right is positive and left is uh, negative. So when the block's displacement from 0 is positive, the spring force is negative. And the further you go, the bigger the force. On the other hand, if your displacement of the object with the spring attached to it is to the left, then you're compressing the spring. Okay, so the displacement of the object is to the left, but the spring force is to the right. So it's more a complicated force. It's not a constant force, but it's about as simple as we can get. A linear force, linearly dependent on position. Okay, and again, that's the kind of motion that uh, is followed. Okay, so when we talk about simple harmonic motion, we actually are talking about a special case of a linear force. Okay, it doesn't depend in any complicated way on position. You double the distance, you double the force, that's it. It doesn't go as x squared or square roots or anything like that. It's a straight line force versus position graph. Okay, so let's look at this in a little more detail. Here's that same graph we just saw. And so our zero here is measured from the spring's just natural length, what we call the equilibrium length or the natural length. And any time a system has this linear force, linear is a function of position, then we say that's Hooke's law, in fact. So Hooke was a contemporary of Newton, and he studied a lot of springs. And he came up with this equation that says, this is just a description of this, um, this force graph. So the force here is minus k times x. So it's proportional to x. So that's the first thing we want to get across. k here is what we call the spring constant. It's uh, basically a measure of how stiff the spring is. Get units of newtons per meter. So the stiffer the spring, the bigger the value of k. And then we got a minus sign in our equation. And that simply means that the direction of the spring force is opposite to the direction of the displacement. OK, so if you stretch the spring, you always have a force. In fact, no matter which way you move the spring, you always have a force 
which is directed back toward the uh, x equals zero position. Okay, so this is kind of our ideal system. We've got uh, forces linearly dependent on position, and the direction of the force is always such that you're trying to restore the system back toward equilibrium. Okay, so in this case, the case shown in the graph, what do you think the value of k is? Okay, so one thing you might notice is that uh, at x equals 1, the force is minus 10 newtons. Okay, so you put that in the f is minus kx equation, and you come out with k is 10 newtons per meter. And it is, in fact, the uh, absolute value of the slope of this graph. Okay, so the minus sign is already in the equation. So the slope is minus 10, but the minus sign is there, so the uh, k, in fact, is 10, 10 newtons per meter. Okay, then we'll start talking about kinetic energy and work and things like that. Okay, so here's a scenario. We have the same force graph we just looked at. We're going to attach a, a block to our spring. Our block's on a frictionless surface. We start the block off at x equals zero. We give it some initial kinetic energy, so its velocity is directed in the positive direction. And we want the block just to reach x equals plus one. So what is its initial kinetic energy at x equals zero in order for it just to reach x equals one? Five joules, 10 joules, 20 joules. What do you think of that? Okay, so we've done this kind of thing before, right? We've had force as a function of position graphs, and we've said something about this graph is related to work, is the work, in fact, and that's directly connected to the kinetic energy. So we can use those ideas to solve this problem. So, in fact, we remember that the area under the curve of the force versus position graph is the work. So here we're going from 0 to 1. Okay, so we've got this blue triangular region shaded in on the graph. And the area of that uh, region is the work. Okay, so the work in this case is, well, we've got to figure out what it is. What's the area of that triangle? Okay, so all, and again, all we need is enough initial kinetic energy so that, when, so that compensates for the negative work done by the spring. Okay, and the work done by the spring is negative because the displacement of the object from 0 to 1 is in the positive direction and the spring force is in the negative direction. So we want k initial when we know k final at x equals 1 is 0 and we can figure what the work is. Okay, so let's go figure out what the work is. It's just the area of a triangle and of course the area of a triangle is 1 half the base times the height. In general, when you've got an equation like this or a graph like this, your base is going to be x and your height is going to be kx. Okay? And the work done is negative, so putting all that together we get 1 half kx times x with a minus sign, so minus 1 half kx squared. Now in our case, we can plug in some numbers, we've got x equals 1 and k is uh, 10. So we get 1 half of 10 times 1 squared, so that in fact is minus 5 for the work. So we've got to have an initial kinetic energy of positive 5 at x equals 0. And then the work takes all that energy away by the time we reach x equals 1. Okay, so we need 5 joules of initial kinetic energy at x equals 0 to make it out to x equals 1. Okay, and re really this is not anything new, right? We've done this kind of force as a function of position graph before and these ideas of work and kinetic energy. So now we're just applying it to this particular case of a, a spring with this linear force as a function of, of position. Okay, so more things about springs. So, uh, so let's say we've done that. We've given the block enough kinetic energy at x equals 0, so it just barely makes it to x equals 1. And so it comes to rest there, at least for an instant. And then it does what? So think about that. And if it stops just for an instant, or if it stops at all at x equals 1, then it's got a force on it in the negative direction. Okay, so it's feeling this force in the negative direction, so it's going to start moving in the negative direction. It's going to move back toward x equals 0. And when it gets to x equals 0, how much kinetic energy does it? do you think it, have? it has? And once again, 
we're back to 5 joules of kinetic energy. And of course, by the time you get to x equals 0, you've got lots of kinetic energy, and your velocity is in the negative direction because the force the entire time between x equals 1 and x equals 0 was in the negative direction. But note that we started with 5 joules at x equals 0. When we come back, after we do a round trip, out to plus 1, back to 0, we're back to the original energy. And this is the same thing you get when you throw a ball up in the air. All the kinetic energy goes away, and then the ball falls back down. You get all the kinetic energy back. And so that's an example of a conservative force, gravity. So here's another example of a conservative force. And any force that is a conservative force, we can think of when we do energy in terms of potential energy. So we're going to define a potential energy for this uh, for springs. Okay, well, we're going to think again about uh, what our block is going to do. So it's gone from 0 out to 1, back to 0. And when it gets 0, it, when it gets to 0, it's got a velocity in the negative direction. How far does it go? Well, of course, it has enough energy now to go out to x equals minus 1. Then it stops there and heads back to x equals 0. And it's got some 5 joules of kinetic energy when it gets back to x equals 0 with velocity in the positive direction and we're back to what we had at the beginning. So then it just repeats this cycle. And it does this over and over and over. So it oscillates back and forth forever. Well, as long as there's no friction or air resistance or anything like that, it'll go forever. Any real system, if you do it, generally stops, of course, after some number of oscillations. But the closer you get to ideal, the longer it's going to oscillate back and forth. OK, so let's get at this idea of energy. Okay. And if you think about what we did for gravity, we say, OK, we've got some object. We're going to raise it a distance of h above the ground. So gravity does minus mgh worth of work on that as we do this, because the gravitational force is down and the displacement is up, because we're raising the object up a distance h. So the work done by gravity is minus mgh. On the other hand, the change in gravitational potential energy is plus mgh. So you can see the potential energy is the negative of the work done by the conservative force. OK, so we, uh, a couple of screens ago, worked out that the energy, the work, sorry, the work done by a spring is minus 1 half kx squared. So our potential energy is plus 1 half kx squared. It's the negative of the work done by the conservative force. OK, so in general, this is how much energy is stored in a spring which is stretched or compressed from its natural length. So x here is how far you've stretched or compressed the spring from its natural length. Okay. So you know if you go 5 centimeters from the natural length, you have a certain amount of energy. If you double that to 10 centimeters, you have 4 times the energy because of x being squared in the equation. Double x, potential energy, goes as... 2 squared is 4, so you've quadrupled the energy when you double the amount of stretch or compression of the spring. Okay, so we're back to our same system where we've got a block on a spring. The big black vertical line represents the equilibrium position, so we can clearly see that we've stretched the spring from its natural length. And we release this block from rest. So initially, it's got no kinetic energy. And it's got lots of potential energy, spring potential energy, or elastic potential energy. And as time goes by, what happens to this energy that's stored in the spring? Okay. So, well, by the time the block reaches that big black line, vertical black line, x equals 0, the potential energy is all gone. But it's all kinetic there. And then the kinetic goes back to potential, and over and over and over. So what you have over and over is the energy sloshing back and forth between elastic potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay, So at the end points where the block stops just for an instant, the, it's all elastic potential energy. And at the midpoint where there's no elastic potential energy, it's all kinetic energy. Okay, But we're conserving mechanical energy here because we've got no energy loss mechanism. So at all times, the sum of the elastic potential energy plus the kinetic energy is constant. Okay, So we just have the sloshing back and forth of the energy here. OK, so 
let's try and use energy to find the maximum speed of the block. Okay, so we can say, well, well first of all, maximum speed is reached when the block goes through x equals zero. And so we can say, well, all the potential energy we had at the beginning, which is where the potential energy is maximum, turns into maximum kinetic energy at x equals zero, the midpoint. And so we can use this energy equation. So all the potential energy turns into kinetic energy. And the potential energy we had at the beginning is 1 half kx max squared. x max is the maximum distance you ever get from equilibrium. And that turns into 1 half mv max squared. And so if you solve for uh, v max, the halves cancel out. And you get v max is x max times the square root of k over m. Okay, so let's see if that makes any sense. So let's say we keep x max the same. x max is where we let it go from. Maximum displacement from equilibrium. So if we have a stiffer spring, then the thing's going to get there to x equals zero faster. That makes sense. What if we have the same spring, but we replace this block by a block with a bigger mass? Well, then the spring exerts the same force, but it doesn't have the same uh, acceleration. It's got a smaller acceleration, so we have a smaller velocity. So the bigger you make k, the bigger v gets. The bigger you make m, the smaller v gets. That makes sense. And finally, note that we do usually have a special name for this thing that I just called x max. And we usually call it the amplitude and give it the symbol A, capital A. Okay, so if you often see, and you're going to see lots of equations that have capital A in them, but all it represents is the maximum distance the thing ever gets from x equals zero. And x equals zero, remember, is the natural length of the spring. Okay, so that's it for our introduction to um, spring systems, which is our introduction to motion with uh, os oscillatory motion uh, that we call simple harmonic motion, where the spring force where the, in fact, the restoring force, in, in a sense, this is what we call a restoring force. You displace it from equilibrium, you get a force that tries to restore you back to equilibrium. So the restoring force for simple harmonic motion is linear with position. Okay, so that is all for today.